Hi, I'm Antonio Centeno. I'm the founder of Real Men Real Style. Welcome to my YouTube channel. And today I'm going to be talking about seven ways that you can become a better negotiator. Why does this matter? Well, let's just say that by following these techniques and starting to implement these in your life, you're going to save money. You're going to save time. You're going to really save a lot of your scarce resources when you're out there and you're not afraid to start using this stuff. And uh, it's something that there's a lot of myths out there, a lot of misconceptions, and I'm going to try to give you some timeless proven techniques so that you can become a better negotiator. Now, before we get into this, I'm going to ask you guys to please subscribe to the YouTube channel. By doing this, these videos come right to you. In addition, you don't miss any of my ghost videos. What are ghost videos? Okay, these are videos I put out for about 24, sometimes about 48 hours, but then I pull them, I make them unlisted. And unless you got an email from YouTube saying, hey, that Antonio put up a new video, you're not gonna have that link. You may come to my channel and you're just not gonna see them. And unfortunately, you're gonna miss that great content. Now, if you like this video, if you've got something to add, make sure to click on the like button or go down into the comments and give me some feedback. Let me know how I can make these better. Okay, let's go ahead and dive into this. The number one thing you need to understand about negotiations is that most people aren't very good at it. Why does this matter? Because if you understand that, you realize that by making a small investment in upping your negotiation skills, you're going to be able to get a lot of mileage out of that. It's kind of, I, I talk about this a lot in men's style and probably many of you guys have been following my channel for a while. You've noticed this. You start to up your game just a bit and all of a sudden you're setting yourself apart. The same thing with negotiations by starting to apply proven tactics and the stuff I'm going to mention, the other tips, a lot of this comes out of research that's been done at people at really smart schools, University of Texas, Harvard, uh, Stanford, all of these schools where they have gone, people with 20 pound brains have done all this research and this stuff works. So simply by reading a book on the subject, you're going to elevate yourself by taking a course. Now I've got a course within my style system here at Real Men Real Style that I offer, but I would recommend if, if you don't want to take my course, go take one at your local junior college, at least read a book, but it's not just about the information guys. You have to practice doing this. Okay. So again, understand that most people are pretty bad and most people actually think that they're a decent negotiator when it comes down to it. They're maybe about average because they're just not applying the, the right techniques. So the number two thing that you need to pay attention to is understanding yourself. Now I know this seems uh, you know pretty general so I'm going to get a little bit more specific. But first off, you need to know what your BATNA is. So BATNA stands for best alternative to a negotiated agreement. Um, again, one of those terms that came out of one of those really big books out of Harvard and basically the BATNA is where you're not going to go anywhere less than. I know any of you guys out there own a company or if you've ever agreed to something that you take a step back and maybe the next day or even later that day, you're like, man, why did I agree to that? You know, you, you know what I'm talking about. You felt that because you didn't have a set BATNA when you went into the negotiation and we negotiate all the time. Every time you go into a store and you make a purchase, there's a bit of a negotiation there. It seems like it's one way, but there's a lot of stores that you can actually bargain with. Uh, now, in the United States, a little bit harder, but if anyone has traveled abroad, you'll see that bartering and going back and forth and, and you know, a little bit of negotiation happens a lot when you can go to a vendor at the end of the day. He's got fruit that he needs to get rid of. This is going to go bad. He's going to throw it out and you can make an offer. There's, you know, but when you know your BATNA that, you know, let's just, I guess, use the fruit example, but you know that, okay, the fruit has to be at this level because if you were to pay for it and if it was at a lower quality level, then you're willing to accept it was, you know, you're not going to like the agreement. You're going to have a certain amount that you're willing to pay. And if you go beyond that, then you, you, you know that you're going to not be happy because you got to be careful in a negotiation. And this again is part two of knowing yourself is be care, careful of focal points. And these are emotional things that, you know, we're emotional beings. So oftentimes there are certain things that we focus in on in a negotiation and we get laser focused and we forget about all the other things around the negotiation. This often happens when someone's going to negotiate for a sal, you know, for their salary. But if anyone's worked for a company, you realize there's a lot more to working for a company than the money. 
There's also, well, how many hours are you going to be expected and required to work? How much leave time? How much sick time? How is it? Can you work on Fridays or maybe Mondays from home? I, I mean, how much travel are you going to need to do? And are you going to get this in your contract? So there's all these other things. But oftentimes when we're negotiating our salary and whenever you're getting hired, that's actually you're in your best point to negotiate. We're just looking at the number. We're not necessarily looking at all these other things when if you're a family person, you may realize, you know, honestly, you know, giving up a couple, not, I, I am fine with the salary, but I would rather go with these other things. Here, a great example is uh, when I bought my house here in uh, Wisconsin. I spoke with the woman. She was a distressed seller. I knew she had already gone down on price. And most people were focusing on the price, trying to push her down. I know, and this kind of leads to point three, knowing others, I went ahead and I looked at her. I looked at her wants. I looked at her needs. I looked at her alternatives. And all of a sudden, I realized that, you know, she had been pushed on price. Let's go ahead and see. I wanted the piano. She had a beautiful piano in the house, and I didn't want her to uh, take it. I, I, my wife plays piano, was coming in from my family. My wife and my son were moving over from Ukraine. We didn't have a piano. And I knew buying a piano would cost me at least a thousand, for a piano like this, at least a few thousand dollars. And so I'm like, well, if you can throw this in along with some other furniture pieces, I'm perfectly fine. Throw in all these appliances. You know what? Turned out she, that was a perfect deal. Because when I spoke with her, when I built up trust, and again, I'm hitting on a number of points here, so hopefully you're taking notes. But when I did that, I found out that she, you know, had she just met her college, uh, her, her college boyfriend. Uh, she'd just been out of a divorce, so now she was back with her college boyfriend. And this was an older woman that, uh, you know, she was in love again, and she just wanted to move to Milwaukee. And really start her life over. She didn't want to take any of this stuff. So I actually sweetened the deal. I didn't negotiate on price because I knew she had already dropped quite a bit. And instead, I got a, basically a fully furnished house. And that worked out really well. So knowing yourself, knowing others. So we've talked about you know, point one, point two, point three. Let's go ahead and go to point four. And that's understanding the situation. So many negotiations are we it's not just a one-shot deal many of them are repetitive or it's a long-term negotiation so whenever i was uh, getting this new studio space and i was getting my office i remember seeing what the price was for this space and it was something that i spoke with the owner uh, over the period of about a year and i watched his price go down a bit now here's the deal is i didn't want to lowball him and try to get just this lowest price because you know what I've got to deal with him every single month. I send him a check. He also has the ability in two years to substantially increase my price. Now, I have the ability to leave as well, but I looked at this as, you know, this is a guy that if I go too low, he's going to want, basically, he's not going to maybe answer my phone calls if I've got something going wrong. So you've got to think about the situation. So that's number four. Uh, there's a few other things in situation which probably goes beyond this video, but scarcity, uh, ideology, those are things, I mean, you look at what's going on in the Middle East, there's a reason why they have had conflict for as long as it's, you know, it, I mean, gosh, over a, what, a couple thousand years? I mean, simply ideology, the inability for people to agree on some very basic fundamentals. Scarcity, let's look at California, Arizona, and Nevada. Well. They've, they're going to have a water issue here very soon and because there's only so much water and right now California's taken more than its fair share. That negotiation agreement, I think it's already up or it's going to be, there's going to be a huge thing there because there's a scarcity of water. In addition, you want to look at uh, is this a negotiation of necessity or opportunity? Now, if anyone's a Star Trek fan, you remember the part where the Klingons actually had to negotiate with the Federation because uh, what was it some, something exploded? I don't remember which Star Trek it was. But I was like, you know, there is, they've got to negotiate because basically it's out of necessity versus a negotiation of opportunity is one that probably both parties could walk away from a little bit easier. And is agreement required? Whenever you're getting a divorce, an agreement is required uh, versus if, you know, other ones in which an agreement isn't required. Let's go to number five, which is Make And now I'm going to give you some very specific things that you can do in a negotiation to make sure that you get the best deal beyond your BATNA. So the first one is make the first offer if you are prepared. If you're not prepared, 
There's another type of thought that says, go ahead and let them make the first offer and actually see if it goes well beyond your baton and then try to raise it up. But if you're prepared, if you know a whole lot about them, if you've got, inf and you know yourself, uh, you know that uh, you've, you understand the situation, then you can go ahead and put in a very pinpointed offer. And the power of doing this is you set an anchor. Now, I do this actually quite a bit in uh, with my business on, on pricing or other things like that. Whenever I'm putting out products, whenever I'm putting out things, if you actually go back and you look at the, the way I put things out there, a, a good example would be a car lot. So if you go onto a car lot and you look uh, and there's a Ferrari, first car you see, really, really nice, $200,000. Well, we're looking at that car and if then you see a, let's say a Ford next to it and the Ford's only like fifteen to $20,000. I mean, it's an, it's a mid-size, you know, decent vehicle. But compared with the Ferrari, because of the anchor that price is set, this seems inexpensive. This seems cheap. So whenever you can make, in a sense, and that's what the dealership is doing, is they're putting out something to set the price high. And that's why dealerships often have some of their highest priced items right out there and then the lowest cost things in the back. The same with stores, is that they're setting your expectation of what the store is. And whenever you can make your first offer, again, you are prepared. You know yourself, you know the other person, you know the situation. Then all of a sudden, you can set the anchor and you can set, kind of like set the tone for the negotiation. Now, let's say something happens in your negotiation and they make the first offer and it's really low. Well, immediately what you want to do is re-anchor the entire situation and this is where you want to come back very quickly. You want to go to the point and the idea is, so if they come over here at the low point, you come over here at a much higher point with the goal that, okay, we're going to at some point get here in the middle because my BATNA is, is over in here. So you've kind of lost a little bit of the, of the edge but there are people that are you, you'll be able to get that back if you re-anchor correctly and kind of set the uh, set it all back to uh, to zero. Okay, so we're also going to talk about the power of fairness. Now, this one's very interesting because they've done these studies in which they show people they give people a um, dollar and they say, okay, you guys need to divide it up. One person's going to divide. However, the other person can veto the whole deal and say, well, we're just not no deal and we're not going to get anything. And what they find is that a lot of people they simply go 50-50 because it's fair. It seems like that's the right thing to do. But what happens when someone starts going 60-40, 70-30 and literally because they're the one dividing and they get to take the first share and then they're going to leave that 30 cents or that 20 cents for the other person. Well, shouldn't that other person just accept it? Because I mean, it's better than getting zero. But logic doesn't apply here because they violate the rule of fairness and the farther they do violate that rule, most people are going to say, you know, that is not fair. You're completely ripping me off and I'm going to go with zero. And, and they do it. It makes, come on, let's think about it. It makes no sense. You would be, even if it's a penny, you're actually a penny richer. But what, what has been violated is the perception of fairness. So when you're in there, and this is so important that you know the other person, because if you violate their perception of fairness, you can really, all of a sudden, there's a logic goes out the window and all of a sudden you're dealing with someone that maybe is looking at this out of an emotional and that's the focal point. They're like, this person, obviously I can't trust them and they're trying to take advantage of me and uh, I'm just, you know, I'd rather, despite both of us, make the negotiation fail. So make sure to pay attention to fairness. Okay, so number seven, this one is perhaps my favorite, is expand the pie. I sort of talked about it a little bit earlier, but oftentimes in negotiation, we focus in on one thing versus actually creating trust, sharing information, looking, are there multiple issues and are there multiple parties that could be involved? Whenever you do this, all of a sudden, you can take the pie that's being split and you can expand it. Most people when they're negotiating, one of the myths out there is that the pie is limited that there are scarce resources. Now, occasionally there are scarce resources, but a lot of times there's a number of issues in play. You can bring in a number of players and you can, in a sense, make the whole thing bigger and you can create what are called win-win situations. And that's ideally what you want to go. Now, let's a great example is look in the basketball world. So here in the United States, we see these multi-team trades 
where one play, you know, you got three teams, sometimes even four teams, and players are just going all over the place, money's moving, contracts are moving. At the end of the day, everyone's happy. Everyone agreed to this. I mean, no one put a gun to anyone's head, at least that I know of, and made these trades happen. So, because they involved multiple parties, they all of a sudden expanded the pie. They were able to do things that two people perhaps weren't. Another way of expanding the pie is, again, talking. I used the example of me buying my house. That was expanding the pie. I listened and I understood what other issues, whenever you're negotiating a salary or you're talking with the company, perhaps the company if you're pushing that you just don't want to travel, but they the whole reason they're hiring you is they need you to travel, well, maybe it's something they're willing to you know double your salary because uh, to be honest, they're incredibly profitable. They just simply they want you, but they want you to travel. So you're going to have to find, okay, you know, I'm a single guy. I can put it, I'll go ahead and take that extra bit of money. I'm not going to see my girlfriend as much, but this will enable us to save up for a house. So again, look how you can expand the pie. So let's go ahead and summarize really quick, guys. One, most people are ineffective when they negotiate. Number two, know yourself. Number three, know the other party. Know who you're negotiating with. Number four, understand the situation. Number five, make the first offer. Number six, understand the power of fairness. And number seven, expand the pie. Okay, guys, hopefully you found this useful. You know, I'm expanding over here at Real Men Real Style, and I really do appreciate your support, but I know a lot of you guys want more information about men's style and other, you know, skills and things that men should know. So make sure to go download our free 47 page ebook. It's over, uh, just go to realmenrealstyle.com. I've got that ebook, it's there for joining my email list where every week I'm gonna email you a couple times, and usually I send you off to, you know, just give you some great tips and, uh, that's it, guys. I will see you in the next video. Take care.